Welcome to Drake Well Museum and Parks Winter Academy, How Oil Changed the Landscape. My name is Sarah Goodman. I'm the museum educator um, and the mon moderator for this evening's program. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with Drake Well Museum and Park, we are uh, located in Titusville, Pennsylvania and are one of several historic sites owned by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and administered by the Pennsylvania Historical Museum Commission. Drake Well preserves and interprets the site of the Drake Well chronicle. I cannot say that word, chronicling the birth and development of the petroleum industry in Pennsylvania and its growth into a global enterprise. We are pleased to have join us this evening, um, Ivy Kuberry, and we thank her for helping us wash away winter blues and discovering more about this region's rich history. I would also like to thank the Friends of Drake Well Incorporated for helping us uh, bring this program to you tonight. So let's just go over a few little logistics um, one more time so that we can uh, then get into the program. Just a reminder that um, during the presentation, um, we appreciate if your cameras are off and your microphones are off. Um, and if you do have a question, put it into um, the chat and then we can answer the questions as we go along in the chat or we will save them till the end. Um, also, um, please feel free to make any comments or converse with your fellow attendees. So now without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Ivy. Ivy, um, if you'd like to share your screen and start talking, um, we look forward to hearing from you about how oil changed the landscape. Okay, well, thanks so much, Sarah. Um, I figured I'd introduce myself really quickly, but uh, yeah, my name is Ivy. Like Sarah said, I work at Oil Creek State Park. Um, so if anybody is unfamiliar, Oil Creek State Park and Drake Well Museum and Park share a border. Um, we're right beside each other next door neighbors. Oil Creek is um, in Venango County. We're a little, like around 7,300 acres of park. So it's it's a big area that follows Oil Creek for a little over 12 miles um, and is mostly forested woodland, some wetlands, steep hillsides, um, all of that, which you'll see in some pictures as we go along. But uh, I, as the environmental education specialist at Oil Creek, I teach a lot about environmental education, but also our local history and how those two things are intertwined. So that's what we're going to kind of be focusing on today. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. All right, so we'll just jump right into it. Um, how oil changed the landscape. We're doing an exploration of species diversity uh, before and after oil. A couple of things I wanted to say before we um, go on from here are just that we're doing an exploration of species diversity, right? It's not um, going to be me sitting here listing like what used to be here versus what's here now, because um, there's not really like a good list of that stuff, right? There was not really anybody um, documenting the species that were found here um, in a helpful way uh, prior to the oil boom. So some of the things that we've lost, we might not even know that we've lost. Um, but we'll get into that a little bit more. And uh, I'd also like to point out that whenever I'm talking about species population changes over time, um, it can't, I can't necessarily pinpoint things just to like, oh, this doesn't exist anymore because of the oil boom. There's so many things that were happening um, around the 1800s and a little bit before that. Things are really complex. Everything's intertwined. It's really hard to parse things out. So we're going to look at um, how the oil boom kind of changed the shape of the landscape, how our waterways work, how our forests are. Um, but just keep in mind that like the logging industry, um, farming, the tanning industry, all that stuff is also intertwined into this story. Um, so moving on, I want to start off by uh, talking about a little concept that comes up a lot in my profession which is that the tragedy of the commons. I don't know if you've ever heard of this before, but it's basically um, a concept where 
when each individual person acts in their own best interest, the result is often a harmful overconsumption of resources. So it's not always the case, but I put a little example, uh, a couple examples on here. The really pretty, beautiful pink flower that you see um, there that is a pink lady slipper. It's an orchid that is really sensitive. It needs very specific light requirements, very specific moisture requirements. And we do have these growing at Oil Creek State Park, which is really, really cool. Um, not right now, of course, but in the spring they'll be out. So an example of the tragedy of the commons would be um, if we were all together out on a hike at the park um, in the spring, and we came across a grouping of these flowers. And I said, you know what, this flower is so pretty, I wanna pick one and take one home. If I picked one, it would probably not damage the population that badly, right? If just one of us picked a flower, but if we all picked our own flowers, then it would, you can see how that would quickly become a problem, um, right? So something that I teach a lot about is leave no trace, leave no trace ethics, um, which boils down to, take only pictures, leave only footsteps, right? Or leave only footprints and try not to leave too many footprints either. Uh, because we wanna make sure that there are still resources out there for future generations to enjoy as well, right? Um, so then the photo of the deer there as well, our white-tailed deer, something that you might not know, uh, is in the late 1800s, they were almost extirpated from Pennsylvania. So extirpated means um, that they were almost removed entirely from Pennsylvania. So they wouldn't have been extinct, um, but they were just not in Pennsylvania anymore. And that's a big reason why the Game Commission was created. So I work for state parks, of course, um, but the Game Commission was created in 1895 uh, because we were over hunting, over trapping, um, doing a lot of pollution and habitat degradation. So it was kind of leading to this issue where we didn't have a lot left. Um, and we were realizing how important conservation was gonna be for our future. So then I just put a little picture of Oil Creek because um, that's what we're gonna be talking about, you know, largely the tragedy of the commons when it comes to Oil Creek. Uh, there's a little quote here from Brian Black from a paper, the Oil Creek as an industrial apparatus. It says the Oil Creek of the 1860s was not a natural resource, not a river, a waterway or a wetland. The Oil Creek of this era was a mechanism in the industrial process of creating petroleum. So um, I teach a lot about Oil Creek and the things that live in there. And this quote makes me a little bit sad to think about. Um, because I know how much great stuff is there and how wonderful of a resource it is, uh, but it wasn't really viewed that way, right? It was um, it was a highway in a factory scape that was creating petroleum. And a lot of the people who lived and worked in this area, this is a, a picture of Petroleum Center down by where the park office is, if you're familiar. It doesn't look like this anymore. <laughs> but the people who lived and worked here, um, they were planning to do so temporarily. And so didn't really have a reason to care too much about um, the health of Oil Creek just for the sake of having a nice creek, right? Um, they were trying to use it for a purpose. So this is, uh, like I said, what Petroleum Center looked like around the, in the 1860s. I would like to take a second and just have you look um, you can see my little cursor on the screen at the creek bed here. There's a lot of material in there. So there's a lot of um, silt and debris. There's a lot of oil in there too, kind of hard to tell in a black and white photo. Um, and you can kind of see uh, runoff on the edges of the creek here. There's not really a whole lot of plant life there anymore. Um, you got a few trees here and there, but not much. So whenever industry was really heavy in this area, there, there was a lot of deforestation, right? And when you get rid of trees um, and other vegetation, there's no roots left in the stream banks to hold the soil in place, okay? So that becomes an issue um, because all of that stuff is just washing into the creek 
and the creek bed gets wider and wider and wider. Um, also, all of that sediment getting washed into the creek becomes a problem as well. It can clog fish gills and um, create like a layer, a thick layer of sediment on the bottom of the creek that can cause a lot of problems for macroinvertebrates or little bugs that live in um, on the stream bed that are the basis of the food chain uh, in that ecosystem. So it, it gets to be a big uh, problem. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. But basically, this, this fundamentally changed the shape of the creek um, and the temperature of the creek and how, how it functions today. So you can kind of start to see the picture of how you know, some species that might have lived in Oil Creek prior to this may not be able to thrive there now. Um, but before the oil boom and before this industry, most of Oil Creek State Park or what is Oil Creek State Park now, um, a lot of it was farmland. So it went from being like heavily forested to cleared for farms and then into this heavy, heavy industry um, and into a park. That's the, the basic story behind it. So we're gonna talk about our waters. This is, uh, more recent photo of Oil Creek. It's beautiful and lush because I don't want to um, come across too negative. I don't want this program to be a Debbie Downer. We did lose a lot of stuff, okay? That's that's just how it is. We didn't have regulations in place to protect our natural resources at that time, um, unfortunately. And so now we work with what we've got, right? And we protect what we have and we appreciate what we have. Um, but Oil Creek is a beautiful, beautiful uh, waterway. But like I said, it is a lot wider than it used to be and shallower. It's the same amount of water over a larger um, area passing through. And you can see in this picture how far apart the stream banks are. In some places on Oil Creek, uh, it can be like 100 feet across, which is pretty wide. And for most of the year, Oil Creek is really shallow. In the spring, we get, you know, um, a little bit more water flow through. But in the summer, sometimes it's too shallow even to float a kayak down. Actually, most of the time it's too shallow to float a kayak. Um, so really, really shallow water. Those trees on the stream banks are, you know, kind of far back, spread apart from each other. So there's a lot of sunlight getting down into the creek too. And all of that just makes for warmer water, right? It's shallower, it's wider, um, it's more open to the sun. And uh, there's other stuff we'll get into in a minute as well, but um, we support currently a mixture of cold and warm water species. Um, some fish are very specific to the temperatures they can live in. And um, the colder the water is, the more oxygen it can hold also. So that makes a big difference as well. So having colder water is generally can support more species diversity, um, just something to keep in mind. So here I've got an outline of the Oil Creek watershed, which is very fun. Everything highlighted um, is, is part of the Oil Creek watershed. And if you don't know what a watershed is, it's an area of land that's drained by a river system or other body of water. So basically, um, the highlighted portion of this map, any like surface water, um, like if it rains, um, all of that runoff is going to end up in Oil Creek, okay? So this is important because it basically, if rain is gonna make its way into Oil Creek in this area, so is any kind of pollution that's on on the land surface. So we're when we're talking about like oil getting into the creek and sediment getting into the creek, it's not really just about what's on the stream banks and ending up in there. It's like anything within this area of land um, impacts the stream and the water quality. And then uh, if you see the little purple circle at the bottom here, um, that's the confluence of Oil Creek with the Allegheny River at Oil City. So where it flows in there. Um, so anything that happens in Oil Creek is happening to the Allegheny River as well. And then the Allegheny flows down to the Ohio in Pittsburgh, which then goes to Cairo, Illinois, where it flows into the Mississippi River and then goes to the Gulf of Mexico. So this is 
again, me impressing upon you that everything is connected because whatever happens here is impacting everybody downstream of us as well. So we're we're mainly focusing on this watershed, but it's it's everyone that's connected to us as well. And just some little fun facts if you're interested in where the uh, headwaters are of Oil Creek. So that first little red star there is at Canadota Lake. So the west branch of Oil Creek uh, originates at Canadota, which is a glacial kettle lake. It's spring fed too, so it's cold water that comes in. And then the east branch of Oil Creek is from uh, Clear Lake in Spartansburg, which is a lot shallower, warmer water. And that's not natural. It's dammed, the Clear Lake Dam um, is how that was created. So just interesting little things about this watershed we have. And I wanted to talk a little bit about things that have happened in the past that um, have really impacted the waterways and uh, this kind of supports some things we've already talked about. There's a photo here of um, the Pond Freshet disaster in Oil City in 1864. And if you're unfamiliar with the Pond Freshet, um, like we were saying how Oil Creek was used as a highway essentially to move oil um, down to Oil City and then further into Pittsburgh. And Oil Creek is shallow most of the year, right? So how do you get around that? How do you float boats on shallow water? You use dams. So all the dams, um, I think there were up to 17 of them above um, or up along Oil Creek and the tributaries above Oil Creek as well. Um, they would block up these dams, get a lot of water behind the dams, and then pick a selected time let everybody know about it, and they would break the dams in succession to let that flood water rush down the creek. Um, people would cut their boats loose and ride the flood um, down into Oil City, which you can imagine would be really dangerous if you got the timing wrong or if you hit a pinch point like this bridge in this photo um, and some a boat got hung up, then all the boats behind you get hung up. Um, so I read a few estimates of, of how much oil would be moved in a typical pond freshet. And I got, you know, between 10 and 20,000 barrels at a time. And about like two thirds of that is lost on its way to Pittsburgh, um, even without disasters, right? Because there's just leakage and everything. And um, it is a dangerous trip, even if you don't collide with other boats. So we're just thinking about how much of that oil is ending up um, in the creek itself. Um, and then you think too about boats scraping on the ground and all of that sediment that it's getting washed into the creek as these floods are coming up, washing over those bare stream banks. It's washing all of that soil um, into the creek as well. So, And here's a photo of um, the Titusville fire and flood. And this I stuck in here just to, to talk a little bit about how there were lots of fires that were taking place and crude oil, when it's burned, it's not really great for the environment and it isn't really great for human lungs or um, animals either. So, um, I mean, you can just imagine that the, the air quality out here would not have been as good as it is today um, either. And oil can impact uh, critters in all sorts of different ways and every species interacts a little bit differently. Um, but something that I think is interesting with birds specifically, because we always see pictures of birds like after oil spills getting cleaned up. Um, a big reason why it's a problem for birds is because if they get coated in oil, they can't fluff their feathers up. They can't like um, get air in between their feathers, which is how they regulate their temperature, right? So, um, it can be dangerous for them when they get uh, hypothermia from situations like that. So now we're into the actual species diversity stuff. So if this is why you came here, <laughs> thanks for bearing with me at the beginning. Um, these are some photos that I took of plants that exist at the park today, which I absolutely love. These, these are aquatic um, plants. You have blue flag iris on the left, um, pickerel weed in the center, and then wapato or duck potato um, on the right hand side there. These are all like just wonderful native plants um, that probably were 
largely wiped from the area um, whenever Oil Creek was being used as this highway, right? But luckily, um, a lot of our plants, they had seeds in the soil. Um, so even though the plants themselves were gone and maybe a lot of those seeds were washed away, um, some of them still existed uh, and were able to kind of recolonize and come back. So we are very, very lucky to have a, a great deal of plant diversity. But the problem is, like I said, we don't really have, um, we didn't have anyone chronicling a list of the plants that that existed here before the oil boom. So what did we lose? You know, we have all this wonderful, like these beautiful plants that are really important to wildlife. Um, but what don't we have? We don't know. And then when it comes to uh, animals and things in the creek uh, or wildlife. We do have, so we stock trout in Oil Creek, and actually I think they're doing that on the 6th, if anyone is interested in, in seeing that. It's kind of neat to get out and see the uh, Fish and Boat Commission stocking the stream. But we stock um, rainbow trout and brown trout. So we do have um, native brown trout populations in Oil Creek and the, the smaller tributaries that are a little bit cooler water. And then this picture um, up here is, on the upper left, is um, a brook trout, which is actually our state fish. So it represents Pennsylvania. And the brook trout, we have native populations of those on the park as well, um, but only in a couple of streams. And they're very, very specific, like they like cold water. Um, so they typically are in our streams that have a bunch of hemlock trees growing on both sides, which will be important later. Everything's connected and we'll get to the hemlocks. Um, but yeah, we stock brown trout, we stock uh, rainbow trout. Rainbow trout are not native to Pennsylvania. So you would not have come out here and found rainbow trout here prior to the oil boom. Uh, that that just wasn't a thing. So rainbow trout are a Western species um, and they were brought out here and stocked to replenish, you know, the the um, trout species that are native that we were kind of low on from overfishing. Again, tragedy of the commons, right? When there's no limit and everyone can take whatever they want, things tend to disappear. Um, but yeah, there are some species of fish uh, other than trout that we have in the creek, right? Smallmouth bass. Um, there's a pumpkin seed in the upper right corner that I got out of uh, Benninghoff Run, which flows into Oil Creek. So there, there's a bunch of different, I mean, there's catfish. Um, we have, oops, sorry, I'm scrolling through. Got a sneak peek. So we do have um, catfish in the creek. Um, we've got some different darters and chubs and and things like that too. But there are some other species that I think are really interesting to talk about that aren't in the creek. So we have some um, species like uh, blue breast dar darters and spotted darters, gravel chubs. Um, we have a lot of species like that that are currently existing in the upper Allegheny River and lower French Creek, um, but not in between. And so it's kind of interesting when we look at species like that, that have population distributions, um, that they seem a little separated. It, it's almost like, you know, I don't have a list of the species that were in Oil Creek before the oil boom, but would those species have existed in Oil Creek before all the environmental degradation that had happened? Maybe, possibly, and probably for some of them. Um, so it's interesting to think about that and, you know, kind of explore the idea that some of these other species might have, might have been here and we just might not have them and might not be able to support them based off of um, the current, you know, shape and temperature of our creek. I added in here too a couple pictures that I took from uh, the park. There's a red spotted salamander and a, um, or a red salamander, sorry, and then a um, spotted salamander. So those species are really, really cool to see and you don't see them super often. Um, but salamanders are indicator species. So basically when an area gets polluted or has a, a major event um, like that, 
these are the first things to disappear because they're very, very sensitive to pollution. So the fact that we have spotted salamanders, um, and we've got a ton of different kinds of salamanders, um, the fact that we have them is really, really good and positive, and it's something, you know, nice to focus on. And we've got some other species to talk about here. There's a lot of good stuff that does still live in the creek. So uh, this big picture of mussels on the right-hand side here, they're also an indicator species. A lot of them are. They're very susceptible to pollution. And uh, French Creek is well known for having a huge amount of mussel diversity, but uh, the Allegheny River is incredible. It has 48 different species, which is like the best in the state for uh, mussel diversity. Oil Creek has less than 20, um, but I was surprised by this. I, I was surprised that we still had as much diversity as we do, considering how um, how fragile some of these species are. So the northern riffle shell, um, there's two different species in this picture, <laughs> if you're really good at telling them apart. The, uh, the northern riffle shell is, uh, if you can see my clicker there, um, these two in the center that have really narrow green rays going down. And then there are club shells in this photo too, which are the kind of bigger um, species in that photo. So in Oil Creek, we do have northern riffle shells, which are endangered, which is, I, I mean, important to know so we can protect them. They're an endangered species. We might not have them for a lot longer, um, but we do have them in Oil Creek. We don't have the club shell that's in the Allegheny River, um, but we do have the riffle shell, which is very neat. And then we've got the American toad in that picture in the bottom left, who... Um, I took that, they they lay eggs um, at one of our sampling sites that we use with uh, high school students to check out our, our water quality throughout the year. So we found a bunch of eggs and some singing toads, which was nice. <laughs> and then at the top there, I put a, a spotted turtle photos. We do have lots of different turtles at the park as well. Um, but again, there are probably some that we don't have anymore. And likely during the oil boom, we might not have had many, if any, um, turtles around. They, they're they a little different than other species in that it takes them a bit longer to show negative impacts uh, from oil spills specifically. So one thing that we can do when we're looking at, uh, when we're trying to explore species diversity and how it might've changed, and we don't have these historical lists, right? Um, we're looking at species uh, population spread, like where the different populations are located. We can also look at um, similar waterways that are impacted by oil spills, um, where researchers are actually like studying the impacts of those spills on species that we might also have here at Oil Creek. So one example that I go back to a lot is the Enbridge oil spill in 2010 in the Kalamazoo River. Um, because people were paying attention to that, right? And then scientists were going out and they actually collected a bunch of map turtles, um, northern map turtles, and did research to figure out like, how are they impacted by oil spills? Do, do turtles do okay? Because they can move, right? Our plants can't really move. Um, and our mussels, they can move a little bit, but not too much. But turtles, they can, they can get out of oil, right? So they did some research where they they took some map turtles and cleaned them and then kept them for several months and um, watched to see their survival rate and then had other spotted or other map turtles that they did not do that with. Um, and the survival rate was, of course, way better with the turtles that they had cleaned. But the situation is a lot more complicated than that, too. It's like, does an oil spill impact the food resources that are available? Probably. Um, is there oil pooling in places where the turtles are trying to hibernate? Does that impact them? Um, there's a lot of just unknowns, right? And so we we can look um, into similar situations, but there are still going to be things that we just don't know um, yet. But we do have a bunch of turtles now. So if we had lost them all at one point, at least some species did come back into the area, which is nice to know. Um, and then we have some macroinvertebrates. Again, I mentioned earlier about these being kind of the basis of the food 
um, the food system in, in the creek. So uh, the upper left corner, we have a really big crayfish who's in berry, which means she has eggs. That's what all these little black um, circles are. So she's just got a ton of eggs, which was super, super cool to find. Um, and we found that at a program where we were catching crayfish and measuring them and identifying them. And um, this was, there were a lot of younger kids there. So we were trying to figure out like, are males or females bigger? And like, which ones, um, which ones do, you, do we think are better fighters? Which ones have bigger claws? Which ones are more protected? It's just kind of fun to poke around and look at that stuff. But um, crayfish are not as susceptible to pollution as some of our other macroinvertebrates. So like dragonflies and damselflies, um, on the right hand side there, there's one hatching. You can kind of see its uh, larval state right below it. And then we have a helgramite down here, um, the bottom left, which is a predator, but um, they are a macroinvertebrate. They'll hatch out. Um, they're really cool if you if you ever get a chance to look them up. Helgramites and fish flies. And then in the center here are stone flies. Um, golden stone flies. That's kind of what Oil Creek is known for. We have a ton of those. And mayflies. There's several different species of mayflies. This is just one of them. Um, the mayflies, stone flies, helgramites, fish flies, damselflies, dragonflies, those are all really, really sensitive to pollution. So the fact that we have those in the creek is incredible. And we it seems like we get more and more of them every year, um, which would make sense because we still have cleanup efforts um, that go on in and around the park. So the water quality is just continuously getting better. Um, so it's really, really promising to see that. These were likely wiped out during the oil boom in this section of the creek um, that is now Oil Creek State Park, but there were probably holdout populations in the smaller streams that weren't as impacted that were able to eventually make their way back down into the creek. Um, so again, good to see, but interesting to think about what might not be there anymore that we just don't know about. And we'll pop into forests for a little bit. Um, so our forest diversity is a lot different than it used to be. Um, there's, like I said before, a lot of reasons for this. We had the logging industry come through, but with logging, um, that didn't really do as much to the section of the Oil Creek Valley that became Oil Creek State Park um, as it did other um, parts of Venango County, other parts of our area, because there's very steep hillsides that are just kind of inaccessible, difficult to get to, difficult to log. Um, so a lot of Oil Creek was kind of okay um, until the oil boom, when people started, you know, leasing out their properties, um, and people were just sinking as many holes in the ground as they could, they needed all that wood to build oil derricks and houses and businesses and um, engine houses and all all of this stuff. There was a lot of wood that was needed, um, so it, a lot of it was cut down, right? And that deforestation, of course, impacts wildlife. Of course, impacts plant diversity. Um, but we, right now, we're in a very unique and wonderful place um, as far as plant diversity goes, because we are, in western Pennsylvania, we're kind of the limit for a lot of um, southern species. They won't go much higher than where we are, and there's a lot of northern species that won't go much lower, and a lot of um, eastern species that won't go much further west. So we have like a high diversity of um, plant life especially trees, which is just really, really cool um, and unique. But yeah, we'll get into this a little bit more um, in a couple slides. So here's our wildlife, our wildlife slide. There's a lot we could talk about here. This is hard for me to pare down. Um, and the Pennsylvania Game Commission has a ton of really great resources, uh, really great information on this. So on the left there, we have a picture of um, the Allegheny wood rat, which um, the Allegheny Mountains are, of course, part of its range. It's considered state threatened and protected, and they used to rely heavily on chestnut trees, um, which, of course, they can't anymore because we don't really have chestnuts. We lost most of our chestnut trees to a blight that was introduced. Um, 
another interesting thing with our elk, the elk that you can see in Pennsylvania, those are not Eastern elk, Eastern elk are extinct. So um, these elk that you can find like over in Benazet, they are actually from Yellowstone. So we had purchased elk from Yellowstone and brought them back to Pennsylvania because we had hunted them out of the state. Again, tragedy of the commons stuff, right? Um, but we did bring those back. So that's kind of um, a common story for a lot of species in Pennsylvania that we kind of hunted them out, extirpated them and had to bring them back. Um, gray wolves and mountain lions, I did not include pictures of, but they are extirpated from Pennsylvania. So um, there's no wild populations of mountain lions or gray wolves anymore, but there used to be, and they would have been all throughout the park, which is just kind of blows my mind to think about that. But they were hunted out, um, of course, because people kind of feared them and were trying to protect their livestock and their families. But some species actually did better because of um, the amount of changes that we put this area of land through. So I have a picture of a coyote up there and um, Western coyotes were not common in this area in Pennsylvania until like 75 to 100 years ago. Um, and Western coyotes are way bigger than Eastern coyotes. So there was some uh, genetic research done to kind of see why that is. And our Western coyotes have um, some gray wolf DNA. So they've kind of um, interbred and made bigger coyotes that are now super, super common all throughout this area. Um, so something interesting, like when when uh, certain animals benefit from from a little bit of habitat destruction, it's kind of, it's interesting to think about that too. And our bluebirds, this is um, from our bluebird uh, cavity nesting program. So we have boxes all throughout the park to support bluebird populations. When people started farming um, in this area and started like clear cutting big swaths of forest, we got more bluebirds and we got more barn owls. Um, and now we're we're sort of at a point where we're letting a lot of those farms grow back up. And so now we're starting to try to protect those species that needed needed the farmlands too. So it's a delicate kind of balancing act. Um, but their populations have changed a lot throughout time. Uh, and then this is Sarah's favorite slide, the snakes. Um, on the left, there's a timber rattlesnake, which we, I mean, we used to have in the park. Um, I haven't seen one since I've been here and we haven't had any confirmed sightings of them in the park. Um, Unfortunately, snakes are one of those critters that when people come across them, a lot of times they they don't understand how important they are to the environment, so they kill them. Please don't do that. <laughs> They're great. Even if you don't like looking at them, just walk away, right? Um, but the timber rattlesnake we used to have, um, and then on the right, there's a Massasauga rattlesnake, um, which is still found in the county, but not within uh, Oil Creek State Park. I've read different accounts that say that um, we might have had them within the park boundary. They kind of like a prairie ecosystem, like a, an open, um, more open field area, and they overwinter in crayfish holes. Um, but the way that Oil Creek has changed shape um, over time and gotten so much wider and taken up so much more space, if we did have them, um, we surely have destroyed the habitat that they would have needed. And I stuck a, bo or a box turtle on there too, Eastern box turtle. Uh, they're species of special concern, so they're not endangered or threatened, but they're likely to become that soon. This is a terrestrial turtle, but one that needs woodlands. So deforestation, you can imagine, would be a problem for them, but we do still have some. Um, and then we're kind of getting into plants. I'm trying to go, I, there was so much stuff, it was hard to pare this stuff down because it's all so interesting. I went down so many rabbit holes with this. Um, but I put some pictures here on the left is Pioneer Run, um, during the oil boom, of course, you can see there's no trees on that hillside, just oil derricks. Um, and then on the right, that's a picture of one of our vistas at the park looking down onto Pioneer. And it's just totally different, right? It's so much, so much healthier. Um, like the picture on the left is not a forest. The picture on the right, of course, is. It's just a lot different than it used to be. Um, so we used to be 
uh, we have a ton of hemlock and white pine and chestnut. That was primarily what was out here. Um, we've lost species like Atlantic white cedar and swamp cottonwood. They're extirpated. Um, and then, yeah, our, our chestnut trees, like I said, super rare and they don't get very big. Um, and our hemlocks, we still have patches of hemlocks, right? But there are a lot of species that rely on those. Uh, and at one point we didn't have hemlocks, right? Because we used those for the tanning industry, for tanning hides, um, but also used hemlock lumber to build things. But for hemlocks, there's a bunch of birds like veeries and golden crowned kinglets and warblers, including the Blackburnian warbler that's very specific to hemlock forests. Um, Dark-eyed juncos, pine siskins, sharp-shinned hawks, um, they all rely on, on hemlock ecosystems. Um, and hemlocks, they keep their boughs so close to the ground and grow around streams a lot of times. So they keep that stream water nice and cold and shaded, which is great for insect larvae and trout. Um, and it, they're also great trees for rough grouse and turkey and uh, small-footed bats and deer and bear. Uh, they're just excellent, excellent trees. Um, but uh, we're having issues with those now still. So we had totally basically totally lost them during the oil boom um, in that tanning industry. There's a hemlock on the left. And now we have an introduced pest called the hemlock woolly adelgid that um, kills hemlock trees over time. So there's a picture on the right of a stand of just dead hemlock trees in the Great Smoky Mountains. Um, so we're trying to prevent that, but it's just, you know, a continuing problem. We still have to deal with uh, the effects of that. And here's just a picture of how large some of our chestnut trees used to be. I just thought that was interesting. So you don't see those. And then this is plants mostly. Um, these are things that we currently have at the park. On the far left, that's an usnea, which is, it's a type of lichen. So that's not a plant. That's why I said plants mostly. I wanted to include that because those really only grow in places with really good air quality. So the fact that we have those are, is crazy and just a sign that we've really come a long way from where we were. Um, and then we also have potato bean in the center and poke milkweed, just some really good native plants um, that we're lucky to have. And again, with plants, it's, it's almost harder for me to talk about them than wildlife um, and how they've changed because there's at least some information about wildlife. Um, and I just put one slide about skies. So I would tell you, you know, light pollution is really hard on a lot of species too. And a big reason why we wanted um, to pursue petroleum, right, was as an illuminate to try to extend our days to get more done, be more productive. Um, so of course we use electricity now, which comes from a variety of sources, but, uh, but that light at night can really mess up migrating birds and nocturnal insects and things. So I just felt like it needed a mention. But we are recovering. Uh, we've recovered a lot. You can see a picture of Benninghoff Farm on the right there um, during the oil boom, like no trees whatsoever. Um, and then on the left, I have some uh, kids that came along on one of our park programs looking down onto that same hillside. And it's just, I mean, it's worlds apart. Um, and there is a great deal of diversity at the park. It just might not be exactly what it was um, before the oil boom and before our our impact. So recovery does not mean going back to what we had um, because we can't, right? It's about finding a new and responsible path to move forward and appropriately manage resources so that future generations can enjoy them too. So it's really, really important that we learn from our past um, and accept that we can't go back, but we can do better. And we can teach people and people like to check out cool historical buildings that we've got throughout the park. So um, this is a, a pump house that was um, on the Benninghoff farm. So you can still find these remnants throughout the park. And we've got some continuing impacts. Um, so we've got, this is actually Invasive Species Awareness Week. So I couldn't leave out the invasive species. A lot of um, invasive plants and um, things were actually brought in around the same time as the oil boom in the 1800s as ornamental plants that people just, you know, like the way they look and they plant them around their homes. Um, and an invasive species is something that is not from this area. And a lot of times they're from other countries. 
and they uh, grow really rapidly and outcompete our native plants. So they're a, a big problem because they reduce diversity in an area. They they kind of block out some of our more um, sensitive plants and can actually cause them some species to go extinct. So they're a big problem. It's something we work on a lot um, at the park. And then orphaned and abandoned wells. So um, they're a source of climate warming methane. They can leak methane gas. Um, they can leak oil and gas into water, soil, and homes. Um, the Oil and Gas Act was created to, to enforce um, that well operators plug their wells that are no longer producing in a safe way for the environment and for people. So again, tragedy of the common stuff, trying to prevent that from happening. Um, but some owners can't be found. So there are volunteer groups like the PA uh, Senior Environmental Corps that go out um, and orphan well hunters, they will find these wells and report them to the DEP and we'll get them plugged. Um, so that's an important thing that we have to deal with. And there's just a picture of uh, a well in the middle of the creek being plugged. And this is kind of what happens when you don't, if they if they blow, right? They can uh, shoot brine um, and all sorts of, got all sorts of stuff mixed in with that as well. It's not good for the environment. Um, yeah, and then of course climate change. So in Pennsylvania, the way that um, this is projected to play out is that we're gonna get shorter, warmer winters, which, you know, it was like 60 degrees the other day in February, which was wild, but um, increased flooding events, increased uh, introduced pest problems like uh, mosquito issues and actually higher tick populations too. Um, and changes in species ranges as well. So where species are able to survive is going to shift a bit. And for animals that can move and plants that have a bigger um, range, they might be okay, but some things might not. Um, right. So that's how how Pennsylvania is projected to change. There are some resources to learn more about what the state is is doing um, to mitigate the effects of this um, that are listed there as well. If you're interested in in seeking those out. But climate change is happening for lots of reasons, uh, but a big piece of that puzzle is continuing burning of fossil fuels, right, in large quantities. So um, just kind of figuring out how how do we maintain our way of life, right, um, but also protect what we have and mitigate the effects that are going to take place based on what we've already done. So again, a delicate balancing act. Um, and what can we do? Like, I, I don't want to leave you thinking like, oh, I can't do anything about this because you can. And I want to encourage you to. So um, you can volunteer, right? Uh, we've got tons of volunteer opportunities at Oil Creek. Um, we have a native pollinator garden at the office that well, I always need help with that. That <laughs> helps to support um, native insect species. That's why we put it there. Um, and here's a picture of us kind of planting a patch of milkweed to support monarch butterflies. So um, those are just some little things that you can do that you can see real change from it um, and it feels good, right? We also do invasive species removal um, projects, habitat restoration, all kinds of stuff. You can do community science, like we tag monarch butterflies to see how many of them make it to their uh, hibernating site um, or their overwintering site. and then. Um, we do community science events like bat counts and firefly counts, and we go out and collect macroinvertebrates and um, identify those and figure out our stream quality. So there's loads of stuff that you can get involved in. Um, you can work with your local service forester because most of Pennsylvania forests are actually privately owned, like 70% of them. Um, so if you have your own forest or forested area and you want to learn more about how to take care of that, contact a local service forester. I share my office with one of them so you can contact me and I'll put you in touch. <laughs> um, I didn't put the picture up there right away, but uh, you can reduce your outdoor lighting, um, right? So this is actually a picture. There's a, a graduate student who I was working with. She was doing some bat research to, to uh, check out the genetic um, diversity in little brown bats and try to see how... Um, 
why some of them are more resilient to white nose syndrome, which is an introduced fungus that's killing a lot of our uh, little brown bats and big brown bats as well. So get involved in that kind of stuff, reduce your outdoor lighting, uh, support local sustainable businesses, report leaking wells to the DEP um, or to the park office if you find them at the park and we'll help you um, kind of follow those, those channels to get the right people informed. Um, and yes, that was a, a well in the middle of the creek there, if you could see it. And finally, like, don't stop learning. If you're here, I know you care. So um, you're already doing this part. Never stop learning. Like, get involved whenever you can. Um, the more that you know, the better informed you are, the more you can do to support your local environment, right? And you're already taking the steps to get there. So you're already doing a fantastic job. I appreciate you. Um, and I put some resources together, some that um, I use for this presentation. I just thought I'd throw this on here. If you're checking this out on YouTube um, and want to go check any of these out, you might have a minute to, to check those out there. And now we have a couple of minutes for questions because I talk a lot. But um, if you have any questions that you like we don't get to today, or if you need um, resources or contacts, um, you can just feel free to send me an email or call the park office. I didn't put the park office number there because email is way better. Um, but yeah, I, I want to say thank you guys all for listening to me talk and learning a little bit about species diversity in this area and how it's changed. I know we don't have like exact lists and numbers of things, but it is an exploration and it is really interesting to think about. And I hope it's kind of like sparked some interest um, in you today. So thank you. Well, thank you, Ivy. If you would like to stop sharing your screen. Yep. There we go. I'm looking for the button. <laughs> <laughs> I know it always disappears right when you need it. So does anyone have any questions that they would like to type in the chat or if you would like to turn your camera on or mic on and just, you know, ask your question, you can do that. Um, anyone? I know that one thing that stood out with me with your um, presentation, Ivy, is when you were saying about the wildlife coming back and things and you were saying something about mountain lions and wolves and I thought, well, thank goodness those aren't back. I can't imagine being on the bike trail and all of a sudden a mountain lion just saying, hey. Yeah, yeah. And the, the Game Commission does a work to reintroduce some species into the state, but um, species like that that kind of pose a threat for people and it, it's not really um, kind of what they're they're looking at um, doing at this point, so... I, I just think it's wonderful. We have bobcats. I thought that was so great when I, oh, yeah. I have not personally seen one. I have seen the tracks of a bobcat. Um, I have had friends that have seen them, but um, yeah, I think that's, that's amazing that we have those. Does anyone have any questions for Ivy? No, it was a lot of information. There's a lot of little things thrown at you, but just want to spark your curiosity and your interest, right? And again, if you think of other questions, um, definitely feel free to reach out to me or reach out to Sarah and she'll get you in contact with me. Um, I love answering questions. Well, Especially if you have one that I don't know the answer to and I have to do some digging. That's my favorite. <laughs> Well, we did have one question in the chat and it was, there's one question, well, there's two here. Um, one is, is French Creek named after the French and Indian Wars of the 18th century, early 18th century? And I did a little quick research during your presentation and um, there are several guesses as to how French Creek got its name. And one of them is, is that George Washington named it French Creek because he was dealing with the the war at the time so but I don't know yeah yeah I've heard a couple of different stories about that one <laughs> and then um, we had another question uh, does the Kinzu Dam or the dam at Canadota Lake control the depth of Oil Creek through Titusville um, and you did answer that question the Canadota Lake does because that's the source of of the creek but does the Kinzu Dam affect it in any way? 
Um, yeah, so Kinzu wouldn't affect the depth of Oil Creek. No. Um, no. But it, do it does affect the, the Allegheny and other tributaries. Yes, yeah. Yep, but not Oil Creek. Um, and there isn't a dam at Canada Lake, I don't think. Is there? Am I mistaken in that? There's one in Spartansburg for Clear Lake, because that's a man-made yeah. um, lake. But Canadota is a natural um, lake. I think it's actually the second largest natural lake in Pennsylvania, I want to say. Yep. Hi, Ivy. This is Leah. I'm the one that asked that question. Um, I know I know that there's locks at Canadota that control the, they can use to adjust the level of the lake, but... Mm -hmm. My understanding, and it could be wrong, is that there is or was some kind of a dam, but it's on private property because my understanding is the dam is in really bad shape, but because it's on private property, there's issues with trying to get it repaired. And what, if any, role it plays in the level of Canada Lake and or the level of water that goes into Oil Creek is what I don't really know. And that's kind of why I asked that. So, so there's a, there's a little project for you. Yeah. I was going to say, give me something to look into. Yeah. Look at it. It and see, <laughs> may, maybe there's no truth to it, but that was my understanding that there is some kind of a small dam, but it's on private property and there's issues. So I'm not sure. Maybe you can help help solve that mystery. So, <laughs> Do some digging. Thank you. That is kind of a neat mystery. I'll help you with that, Ivy. We'll yeah. see what we can figure <laughs> out. <laughs> yeah, and I mean it's I think it's really cool to check out um like the things off the park that impact the creek, right? Because so so often I I'm just in the park so I see what's happening in that in that specific area. Um, I don't always get a chance to get out and see what else is in the watershed, you know? <laughs> but good things to think about. Anyone else have any questions, comments, anything for Ivy? Well, if you don't, um, or if you're like me and you you go to lay down and put your head on the pillow and you're like, oh, I should have asked her this or I should have asked her that, um, feel free to either contact Drake Well Museum or contact Ivy at Oak Creek State Park. Not at two o'clock in the morning, though, but uh, via, <laughs> via email or the phone um, and leave us a message and we'll make sure we get back to you with an answer. But I just want to thank everybody again for attending the program, um, the Winter Academy. Um, just to make note, um, upcoming at, at here at Drake Well Museum and Park, we have our in-person lecture series starting on March 7th. Um, the first presentation will be about political cartoons. The next presentation is on the 14th, and that will be about everything and anything pit hole. And then the last presentation on the 28th is about abandoned wells um, across the United States. Um, and that one is really interesting. I got a sneak peek at the um, presentation, and I've already got a ton of questions for him. So, um, you know, join us for those programs. Ivy, is there anything coming up at Oil Creek State Park? Yeah, we actually do have, I mean, we have a load of programs throughout um, my season whenever I'm at the park. Um, and our next thing that we have coming up is actually this Saturday. So we're doing a little bit of a maple sugaring, which this is the first year that we're doing these as like public programs. So if you're interested in small scale maple sugaring and, and kind of learning about that and how you might be able to do it on your own property, um, that's what we'll be doing this Saturday from 10 a.m. to noon at Blood Farm Day Use Area, which is the southern um, day use area on the park. Um, it's going to be fun. I checked the weather. It's supposed to be nice out. Um, and we are going to have maple syrup there that I made earlier this week that you can taste. So 
Well, now I'm really jealous because I have yeah. to work on Saturday and won't be able to come down. So, oh, and if anyone's interested in park programs, um, getting sent to them, I have an email list. So if you email me, I can add you to that. And once a month, I send out an email with everything coming up for the following month. Um, or you can follow our Facebook page, which is just Oil Creek State Park. Um, and everything gets posted there as well. Or alternatively, there's the um, DCNR calendar of events where all of the events happening on state parks get posted. Um, so that's that's like a wealth of information if you go to other parks. So this, if you just Google DCNR calendar of events, um, you'll be able to find that and search any park that you're interested in. Well, thank you so much, Ivy, for joining us this evening. Thank you, everyone, for uh, participating in tonight's program. And we look forward to uh, welcoming you to our sites. And just everybody have a great evening um, and happy, happy Leap Day. For those, if for anyone born today, happy birthday once every four years. <laughs> yeah, thank you all for coming. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Have a great night.